Welcome to Out of Zion with Susan Michael, an exploration of the Bible and the land of Israel. From ancient biblical sites to the story behind the stories, join Susan on a journey through the most exciting book on the planet. Hit the subscribe button for future episodes, which will deepen your faith and bring the Bible to life. And now here's our host, Susan Michael. Well, hey there, and welcome. We're starting a brand new series today called The 3D Jesus. And we're hoping that by bringing out the historical and cultural and geographic and religious context of Jesus, that he's gonna come alive to you like never before. So let's get started. Today's session we're gonna start, we're gonna call Setting the Stage. Have you ever wondered why Jesus was born Jewish? Now, if you have already completed our 3D Bible series, you should be able to answer that. But if you're new to us and this is your first session with us, then you might still be wondering, well, why was he born Jewish? And why did God choose Mary in Nazareth to be the mother of Christ? You know, the Bible doesn't really tell us that. So what we're going to do today is look into some of the background and historical sources and piece together some probabilities. Um, so let's get started. Why was Jesus born Jewish? Well, the Bible has tells us this wonderful story of God's plan of redemption. And when God decided that he was going to redeem mankind, he set a plan into action with a man called Abraham. And he promised Abraham, he said, through you and what I'm doing today, I'm going to make you a great nation. And through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. The Apostle Paul says that that verse was the first preaching of the gospel. So God had chosen to create a nation through whom he was going to carry out this amazing plan of redemption. They were to be the vehicle of that redemptive plan. And so the Messiah Jesus came in fulfillment to these promises that God made to Abraham and then Isaac and Jacob. He promised Moses. He promised David. He proclaimed it through the Hebrew prophets. Why? Because God had chosen to work through this people group, and he was going to bring about the redemptive products such as the covenants and the word and the Bible and the promises and all of this, and of course, the Messiah. So that's why he was born Jewish. God had been working for thousands of years, setting the stage for the birth of the Messiah. And this is why when we begin the New Testament story and the story about the birth of Jesus, both Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, when they um, let loose in praise to the Lord, one of the things they both mention is that these miraculous pregnancies, what God was doing, was in fulfillment of his promises to Abraham. So let's move on then. That's a little bit of a review for those of you. If you're just starting with us, I do recommend that when you have time, go back and listen to the 3D Bible series. It's going to explain all of that amazing story, the story behind the stories in much greater detail. So for today, though, we're going to keep moving. I want to talk about why God chose Mary and Nazareth. Now, as I said earlier, the Bible doesn't tell us why. The Bible just tells us that God did. So I want to look at some of the background here, and we're going to see some amazing things that God was doing uh, when he chose Mary and Nazareth. Um, so, but let's continue our story very briefly to sort of bring us up to this point. 
As I said, God chose Abraham. He was going to birth and birth a nation through Abraham to carry out this great plan of world redemption. But the people after Abraham, they go into Egypt. They end up in slavery for 400 years. Finally, they come out of Egypt. They wander in the desert. And finally, it's the time for them to go in and possess the land. At first, it's a tribal confederation, but then we have the highlight of the history of Israel, and this is when David is king. We call it the Davidic kingdom. And during this time, God makes it clear that he has not only chosen David, he has chosen Jerusalem to be the place where he would place his name and his presence. And um, David wants to build a God a temple, but God tells him no, and he allows his son Solomon to build the temple in Jerusalem. But then after Solomon's sin enters into the camp, actually even during Solomon's days, but then after Solomon dies, the kingdom is split and division is always a sign of judgment. So we have the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, and the prophets began to warn the northern kingdom that judgment is coming, and it does, in the form of the Assyrian Empire, comes in and takes the northern kingdom of Israel into exile. And then, of course, we have the prophet's warning, and uh, now Babylon has taken over Assyria. The Babylonian army comes in, takes the southern kingdom of Judah and all of Jerusalem, and take them into exile. Seventy years later now, the Persians rule over the Babylonian Empire, and the Persians allow the Jews to return to their homeland. They even pay to rebuild the temple. And so this is known as the Second Temple Period, the beginning of the Second Temple Period. And we have the return of the exiles. We read about it in Ezra and Nehemiah, the rebuilding of Jerusalem. There is a religious revival in the land, and we have a number of prophets during this time, and the last of which in our Bible, in the Old Testament, is the prophet Malachi. Now that ends the Old Testament story right there, and it ends somewhere in the 5th century um, before Christ. And um, you may hear sometimes that this begins a 400-year period before the New Testament picks up because the birth of Jesus happens somewhere around 5 B.C. or before Christ. And um, so we have this period of about 400 years. And theologians and all refer to it as like a 400-year period of silence. I think that's very misleading. I don't know that God was silent at all. He was obviously very active, which I'm about to share with you. But the silence means that there was no national prophet or writing prophet that we have the writings of that are in our Bible. So there is a 400-year gap between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I need to cover some of that history there in order to show you how God was so busy during this time setting the stage for the birth of the Messiah. So there, the way we know this history, it's not in our Bible, but there are two books that are known as in the Apocrypha, 1st and 2nd Maccabees. And um, there's also a famous Jewish historian, uh, Josephus. And so from these sources, we are able to piece together a very, very vibrant story of life in the land and what was happening during this 400-year period. So we close the Old Testament under the Persian Empire, which was humongous. And what happens next is in 331 B.C., Alexander the Great defeats the Persian Empire. Now, Alexander the Great has taken the Greek culture um, throughout most of the known world, and he has now defeated the Persians. And so the Greek culture, what we call Hellenization, is rampant, taking place all around the world and all throughout the Holy Land. 
Alexander the Great died just uh, within 10 years uh, later, and his kingdom was then divided up amongst four different generals. And the general that took over the area of Asia, which included the land of Canaan or the land of Israel, his name was Seleucus Nicator, which means Seleucus the victor. And he established what's known as the Seleucid Empire, and it included the Jewish land of Judea, or we call today Israel. Now, the Greek culture that was spreading rampantly throughout the world was very different from the ancient culture that we read about in the Old Testament. Um, the Greek culture brought with it great moral relativism. Um, it brought with it um, a culture that was very much in opposition to the Jewish culture and to the Jewish rules that God had given the Jewish people. And so the, the Greek culture, they went in, they would build new cities, and these cities had to have a theater for entertainment. They needed to have some kind of an arena for racing uh, horses and chariots and all. You could call it a hippodrome or a theater, an amphitheater. Um, they needed to have the bathhouses where all kinds of things <laughs> took place. They, they uh, had the Olympics where um, the sports was done completely naked because of this uh, love and um, adoration of the human body. And with this came the adoration of man. And Greek philosophy sort of set man up as the one to determine what was right and wrong. And man determined basically, do anything you want to. If you want to try it, try it. If it feels good, do it, whatever. And um, this set up a whole new uh, set of Greek gods that they all kind of looked like man. Um, so it, it came with, it was very all-encompassing, and it really uh, promoted what we would call humanism. Um, man was pretty well the center of everything, and great moral relativism, and of course with it came paganism. In every town, there was a pagan temple set up and the worship of these great gods. Now, after 180 years of this process of Hellenization um, in the Holy Land, I have to say that the future of the Jewish people was in the balance because the more they assimilated and the more Greek they became and the more they ad adopted these pagan lifestyles, the less Jewish they were. And this was a real threat to the existence of the Jewish people. And so there was pushback against it. And there were the more religious Jews who pushed back against this and said, no, we should not adopt these ways. And we need to worship the God of Israel in the way that he has had us. We need to live the way he has told us to live. And we should not give in to these forces. So a new king was over the uh, Seleucid Empire, and his name was Antiochus IV Epiphanes. And he decided to enforce the Greek culture on to the Jewish people. So he forbid their Sabbath. He forbid their Torah. Um, he even went so far as to um, sacrifice a pig in the Holy of Holies, which desecrated the temple. And eventually he set up a statue of Zeus in the temple that was built for the one true God. So this was the line in the sand. And some of the descendants of the priestly family of Aaron rose up against this. They were the family called the Maccabees, and they began to lead a revolt against the Seleucids. Miraculously, they reestablished Jewish sovereignty over Jerusalem. They took back the temple. They rededicated it to God. And this is known, um, the Feast of Rededication is a seven day long festival and celebrates this amazing moment in history. This little band of zealots actually pushed back and defeated the Greek forces. 
And once they dedicated their temple, they discovered that the great menorah, which, you know, the light of the menorah, the, more, the menorah would burn for 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And it was in itself a symbol of the presence of God in the temple. If the light went out, it was as though it was that the presence was not there. And of course, the light had been out. The presence of God was not there as this temple was uh, desecrated. But now it's been cleansed. It's been reestablished in worship to the Lord. They light the great menorah and they discover they only have enough oil for one day. And so the miracle of this feast of dedication, which you've heard of as Hanukkah, uh, the Hanukkah celebration is celebrating the miraculous burning of this lamp for eight whole days until they were able to get more oil uh, from the Galilee and replenish it. You know, the real miracle here, I mean, that's a miracle, the burning of the oil for eight days when it was only enough for one. But the real miracle here was that they had defeated the Greek forces. And this rededication of the temple only emboldened them. And they began uh, to extend their rule. At the same time, it's interesting enough that Antiochus IV Epiphanes died just two weeks later. He was on a campaign to, do, to uh, destroy another temple in another area of Asia, and he became very ill. And the Greek um, historian writing about it said that he seemed to suffer from divine displeasure. Now, we don't know if he knows which god was uh, showing displeasure, but I'm pretty sure that the God of Israel was fulfilling his promises to Abraham, that he would bless those that blessed him and his people, and he would curse those who cursed them. Antiochus IV Epiphanes had tried to actually wipe out the Jewish people by making them Greek, and he's the one that ended up being wiped out. Now, um, you know, this is an amazing feat, and this all takes place between the Old Testament and the New Testament. I mean, God saved the Jewish people from extinction. If this story of Hanukkah had not happened, the Christmas story would have never happened some 300 years later. There would have been no Jewish Joseph and Mary. There would have been no temple in Jerusalem for Zacharias to be in when the angel tells him that his wife is going to have a miraculous birth and it'll be John the Baptist, the forerunner uh, to the Messiah. None of this could have taken place because none of it would have existed. So this is an amazing story, and the fact that it's not in our Bible doesn't make it any less amazing. And it's just more proof of what I told you in our 3D Bible series, that the story that began in Genesis continued right straight through all of that period through the New Testament and is still going on today, it's not over. And this Hanukkah story is an amazing part of the story. And so it's so important that we know it. It was part of God preparing the way for the Christmas story. Now, um, there's more to the story though. The Maccabean family uh, ends up setting up a reign, and they were known as the Hasmonean dynasty. And uh, they were all uh, descendants of the Maccabees. And um, they began to reign. They were even called kings. And some historians even refer to this period as a second kingdom of Israel. Why? Well, after the death of Antiochus Epiphanes, the Seleucid Empire was just disintegrating. So this gave freedom to those zealots that had seized their temple back. It gave them the opportunity to actually set up rule and to expand it. And so they expanded beyond Judea and beyond Jerusalem into the northern kingdom area, which is known as the Galilee. Now, in uh, the Hasmoneans ruled for about a hundred years. And then what happened? Well, the Greeks, the Seleucids, 
were taken over by the Romans. And so with the Roman Empire came in new rulers and new forces, and the Hasmonean dynasty was eventually taken over by a very, very uh, interesting and colorful and conflicted man named Herod the Great, who became a vassal of Rome. So now, what does this have to do with Jesus and the Jewish uh, and the Christmas story? Everything. Let me tell you, the Hasmonean dynasty took over much of the ancient kingdom of David, of the ancient kingdom of Israel. And as because of this, and like I say, they ruled for about a hundred years. So during this time, the exiles began to return home. The exiles that had been taken by Assyria and by Babylon, yes, the Persians had allowed them to come back, but it was a very limited return. There were plenty still in exile. And so they began to make their way back to the land. And many of them, um, some of them, many of them, don't know how many, settled in that northern area of the Galilee. Because when the Assyrians had taken the northern kingdom into Assyria, into exile, they took all the Jews out, you know, at least the major rulers, the men, they may have left a few behind, but they destroyed towns and villages. They took the people into exile. And then they moved Assyrians into the Galilee. That's one way that an ancient empire took over territory. So here, the Galilee is now populated largely by Gentiles. And it's very likely that there were exiles now returning. First of all, the Hasmoneans did force some of these peoples to convert to Judaism if they were going to stay in the land. Secondly, we have exiles coming back from Babylon, and they are purposely trying to repopulate the land. It is very highly likely that either Mary or Joseph's or both ancestors had been in exile in Babylon, and they came back during this time, and they built a village over the top of a destroyed village that the Assyrians had destroyed, and they named it Nazareth. Now, why would I say this? How can I say this? is because about 200 years after Jesus' lifetime, there was a, a Jewish Christian historian living in the Holy Land, and he was writing the history of the area. His name was Julius Africanus, and he said that in the second century, so 200 years after Jesus, that there were still blood relatives of Jesus in the area around Nazareth, that makes sense, and in the area around Kokoba. Where is Kokoba? And what is Kokoba? Kokoba was one of the first Jewish towns right inside the border of the Hasmonean kingdom if you were coming on the road from Babylon. So exiles, Jewish exiles, Coming back, they'd been in exile, some of them 400 years. They had completely lost any identity in terms of a tribe or a town. Maybe they didn't even know where they were from in the land, but they knew they were Jewish. And here they had Jewish sovereignty in the land. They come back. Maybe they had people that were elderly or sick amongst them. So they stopped as soon as they got inside the Hasmonean territory, and they built this settlement called Kokoba. So some of the blood relatives of Jesus were found in the region around Kokoba 200 years after his life. And some of his relatives had come on in to the Galilee, the Galilee of the Gentiles, and had built a little village called Nazareth. So this means that Jew Jesus' ancestors, at least some of them, were probably refugees. That's what we call them today. Then they were called exiles, but they were refugees. Interesting, huh?
So, well, why Nazareth? Why didn't these exiles go on down south to Bethlehem? That's where their family lineage was from. They were of the lineage of David, and they knew that. This same um, historian, Julius Africanus, said that the blood relatives of Jesus could still trace their genealogy back to David. That's because they were considered royal. They were royalty. So, of course, they cherished their genealogy, and they could still trace it, whereas a lot of the exiles lost their uh, genealogies. So why did these descendants of David go into the Galilee of the Gentiles and resettle on a village that had been destroyed by the Assyrians? Well, it's very interesting. We don't know why, um, I think it's pretty obvious that they were intentionally resettling the land. Um, you know what that means. That means that Jesus' uh, ancestors were also what we call today settlers. You know, the hot-button word of settler in the West Bank. Uh, they're there because they believe that they should be settling in the biblical heartland of Israel, which used to be called Samaria, Judea and Samaria. So these uh, descendants of David were doing the same thing. They were intentionally settling at the Galilee. They also knew that the prophet Isaiah had had a whole series of amazing prophecies. We find these in our Bible in Isaiah starting with chapter 6 all the way through chapter 11. Amazing prophecies like one you've heard very much every year you hear that a virgin will conceive a son and she'll call his name Emmanuel. Uh, it also said that the Galilee of the Gentiles will see a great light. And later, uh, Isaiah said, And unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and will have no end, and upon the throne of David. And there's another amazing uh, prophecy by Isaiah that a root, uh, that out of the root of Jesse, Jesse was David's father. And so this um, picture is saying, that the tree of David had been cut down to the ground, but there was still a root under the ground. And it said that out of that root would come a branch. And in Hebrew, the word branch is netzer. So out of the root of David was going to come a netzer, a branch, and the Gentiles will seek him. These were some of the prophecies that this religious band of Jews coming back, tracing their, their lineage, would have known that the prophet Isaiah prophesied these things. Were they getting in place? I don't know, but I'm sure that they were praying that these prophecies would come true because these were prophecies about their family, about the family of David. 600 years after those prophecies by the prophet Isaiah, what happens? But the Maccabees take over the Galilee of the Gentiles, and the Jews are returning, and they're populating that area, building the, and there's one little band of the descendants of David that go, and they create their village, and they give it the name Netzeret, which means the little branch. I believe they were acting in faith that God was going to fulfill his promises that he had spoken through Isaiah, and they named their village after that prophecy. Netzer is branch. Netzeret is Nazareth. Nazareth at the time of Jesus was small enough that it was probably just one extended family. It was probably nothing more than about 150 people. Why they called it Nazareth or or why Jesus was known as the Nazarene, it could be their clan had that name, that they were the Nazarenes, meaning they were of the Netzer, they were of the lineage of David. This is why in the New Testament we have a story where there's the blind man on the side of the road, and, and he when he finds out that Jesus of Nazareth is coming by, he says, Jesus, son of David, you know, heal me. 
Jesus of Nazareth was synonymous with Jesus, a descendant of the lineage of David. Interesting, isn't it? Well, um, let's keep moving here. Now, whether there's another scenario, and it is possible that Joseph's family was from Bethlehem, and he and his family, his ancestors, had gone up to join this band uh, in Nazareth. Why do I say that? Because um, Joseph had to go back to Bethlehem to be registered there. We're going to hear about that next week. We hear it every year in the Christmas story. So uh, it could be that his ancestors um, had come up from Bethlehem to join this band of their relatives who had returned from Babylon and were intentionally settling in the Galilee. Uh, we don't know, but it seems very highly likely that Joseph and or Mary's ancestors um, were from Bethlehem and had been taken into captivity <laughs> into Babylon, that they returned under the Hasmonean dynasty, and maybe they were joined by some that came up uh, from Bethlehem. Uh, they were most probably religious Jews that uh, kept their genealogy. It was important to them, and they were praying for the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecies to their family. And so they intentionally moved into the Galilee to be there uh, where these prophecies were going to take place. We don't know, but it seems highly likely knowing that history and that setting. All of this God was doing in the silence in our Bibles in between the Old Testament and the New Testament. He was setting the stage. He was getting everything in place so that according to Luke 1.26, now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth and to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. God had set the stage down to the very last detail. The time had come for his plan of redemption to move forward. Now, is that not exciting? So join me back here next time. We're going to talk about the next part of this story, the birth of Jesus. I can't wait. So please join me then. Until then, God bless you. We hope you have enjoyed this episode of Out of Zion with Susan Michael. Be sure to subscribe to Out of Zion now on Apple Podcasts, cpnshows.com, YouTube, or wherever you like to listen and learn. Out of Zion with Susan Michael is a production of ICEJ USA, all rights reserved.